Momentum continues to build for war between Russia and Ukraine. There are now 127,000 troops flanking Ukraine on three sides. Russia is setting up field hospitals along Ukraine's borders, an ominous sign that wartime is nearly upon us. U.S., British and Canadian embassy staff have been ordered to evacuate, and travel warning advisories have been issued to its citizens. The U.S. is continuing to send tons of strategic weapons and munitions, now totaling $2.5 billion worth, and has 8,500 troops now on red alert standby, while more military support continues to pour in by NATO countries. While this conflict seems to have reached its boiling point, Russia and the West continue trying to talk it out, but both sides have dug in and now seem deadlocked. Will Russia invade Ukraine? Could World War III break out? What many military analysts worry about most is that Putin's increasing propaganda could heighten tensions even further, creating a hair-trigger type conflict that, well, only takes one miscalculation for this whole mess to escalate into full-blown war, or worse, World War III. In order to truly understand what's going on and why 127,000 Russian troops are camped out at Ukraine's back door, you need to get inside the head of one man. Because this is really the story of what Vladimir Putin really wants. Putin would have you believe that his life's work is to undo what he calls the greatest political catastrophe of the 20th century the breakup of the Soviet Union. He would have us believe that that's what he really wants. But remember, Putin always tries to get his way through lies and deception. So let's go deeper and see if we can, you know, get inside Putin's head to help us get to the bottom of this conflict. On July 12, 2021, Putin went so far as to write a propaganda essay he entitled on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Sounds propaganda-ish, doesn't it? Which was of course designed to further feed his propaganda machine. For example, in his essay, he called Ukraine and Russia one people. He called to liberate the Ukrainian people and go back to the good old days of the USSR. His essay makes him look like the greatest Russian patriot of all time and makes us believe that the reunification of the great Russian motherland is his life's greatest ambition. In his writing, he even has the gall to blame the breakup of the Soviet Union on the United States. Of course, he so eloquently disguised it by saying that the guilty party were, quote, those forces that have always sought to undermine our unity. Okay, welcome back to Russia-Ukraine Conflict Explained, No BS, Part 2. In this and upcoming episodes of our series, we're going to go deep from inside Ukraine to uncover the who, what, where, why, and how of this mind-blowing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, so you guys can hopefully make sense of it all. Now, before we get going here, make sure you subscribe and you smash that bell notification so you don't miss out on the inside scoops exposing the hidden truth as reported from government sources inside Ukraine as we continue to bring you the front line of this conflict from Ukraine. So let's start by digging into Putin's real motives to see why, why he's gone to such great lengths to stage this hybrid warfare with Ukraine and brainwash all of us to believe his big lie. Now, if you missed part one, you'll want to go click on the link in the description below this video and you'll see how it is he's getting away with brainwashing pretty much all of us on planet Earth. Also in part one of our series, we explain the how. How Putin is planning to get what he really wants. I mean, while he continues to amass, what, 127,000 troops or so at Ukraine's borders now, Putin still maintains the same narrative. I really don't want to invade Ukraine, but, right? Rather confusing, isn't it? And Western countries say they fear Putin may be planning to invade. Russia denies this, but has said it could take unspecified military action unless its security demands are met. So although it sure seems military action is Putin's how, in reality, how he plans to get what he really wants is much different. 
It's a masterfully planned strategy of brainwashing, fear, and intimidation through classic Soviet hybrid warfare tactics. You can find our full series of explainer videos on this conflict in the playlist link in the description below this video now. First, let's ask the number one cover-up question, why? Why is Putin staging this hybrid warfare with Ukraine? Well, as complex and mind-boggling as this whole conflict is, Putin's MO is rather simple. It's twofold, money and power. Being the world's richest and one of its most powerful men, it's not good enough for him. So his insatiable appetite for money and power is clearly Putin's big why. We'll have more corroborative evidence on that coming up. So let's go deeper to figure out what's his angle. How is he going to get more money and more power? What's he really going for here? What's his play? Let's take a look at his upcoming election just around the corner in 2024. Yet he has a problem. He's faced with his lowest ever ratings. So to bolster his sunken ratings, what does he need to do? Well, he needs to appease or please the people. How can he do that? Well, he can start by improving their economic situation. Okay, well, that takes time. So let's take a look at the worst case scenario. Everybody's afraid of what? Well, especially with all these positioning and support for Ukraine now, everybody's worried about war with Putin against Russia, right? Let's imagine that happens. How is that going to help Putin? Imagine, just imagine for a moment, thousands upon thousands of Russian soldiers coming home to their moms, to their babushkas in body bags. What is that going to do to his ratings? Well, of course, it's going to be the kiss of death for his chances of re-election, right? I mean, there's only so far he can take fudging the elections, right? So, begs the question, what the fuck? Is he doing putting 127,000 troops, even nukes now, knocking on Ukraine's borders? How will Putin try to get away with it? Well, for insights to this question, a rather complex question, I would agree. Let me introduce you to Putin's most feared man, Alexei Navalny, leader of Russia's opposition party, founder of Russia's anti-corruption foundation. Alexei. 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 Russian opposition leader, Alexei, Alexei Navalny. Navalny. In fact, Putin sees Navalny as such a high risk threat to his future presidency, which is everything to him, because without his power, his money and all his cronies' money will be gone. If he were to lose power, the chances of him retiring peacefully are very, very slim. The chances of his cronies retaining their ill-gotten wealth is close to zero. So, he feared him so much he tried to actually take him out with lethal poison. And that when that failed, he locked him up and threw away the key in a maximum Russian security penitentiary just to silence him. So let's take a look at what Putin's most feared nemesis has to say to better understand what Putin is really up to. Well, in his infamous Time interview, Alexei Navalny said Putin only respects two things strength and power and he will use every sign of weakness in his favor remember this is putin's most feared man but why is putin so afraid of alex navalny anyways navalny threatens the only thing putin values more than money power if he were to lose power the chances of him retiring peacefully are very very slim the chances of his cronies retaining their ill-gotten wealth is close to zero. Let's take a look at this to see how Putin stays in power and likely will remain in office till 2036. Tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets, sparked by the imprisonment of one man. An anger about social injustice, political repression, and staggering corruption at the heart of the Kremlin. 
Since then, the repression has escalated as Putin seeks to silence all dissent. The elections were rigged. Putin's united Russia won, retaining a two-thirds majority in parliament, big enough to enable Putin to change the Russian constitution. And it wouldn't be the first time. In 2020, he pushed through amendments that will allow him to remain in office for at least another 16 years. As the 2024 presidential election approaches, Putin has a personal vested interest in ensuring the opposition cannot compete. Navalny says Putin's hybrid war strategy has been in play actually since at least 2014, probably earlier. And such strategy would make a full-scale invasion and an occupation of Ukraine as counterproductive and thus highly unlikely. Not because he cannot do it, but rather because he can, but because it's not needed, it's costly, it's extremely risky, and frankly, would be counterproductive for Putin. It just wouldn't make any sense. In Time Magazine's interview with Alex Navalny, they asked him this question, I quote, what do you make of the broader standoff and outgoing negotiations between the US and Russia over Ukraine, NATO, and the future of European security? What do you make of it, Navalny? He said, to paraphrase, time and time again, the West falls into Putin's elementary traps. He issues some insane, laughable demands, like his latest ones about pushing NATO country membership back to 1997. And then if he doesn't agree, he'll pull off some BS, something shocking. Instead of ignoring his nonsense, the US accepts Putin's agenda and runs to organize some kind of meetings, some kind of entertainment of concessions, just like a frightened schoolboy who's been bullied by a classmate. Then they declare, okay, if you pull something, we will impose harsh negotiations. That's exactly what Putin needs and wants because it follows that if he does not attack Ukraine, well, then there won't be any sanctions, right? He didn't do anything bad. They'll just be the carrot, no stick. Well, with that, Putin's combination is complete. Putin doesn't need to worry about any sanctions that were nearly imposed on him and his cronies. They're cancelled entirely because, well, he's been a good boy now. Yet since they promised Putin the carrot, he gets the carrot. And no stick. So it's a total win. It's a landslide victory for Putin. He gets what he wants, or at least part of what he wants, with no consequences. These two move combinations are elementary and obvious by Putin. But as Navalny says, I just can't wrap my head around how Putin pulls this shit off with American politicians time and time again, president after president, you know, rinse and repeat, threaten to escalate, negotiate, get concessions, pull back. It's like his magic recipe to get what he wants and get off scot-free, despite the huge international costs he's inflicted on us all. One of our first clues about what Putin's really going to pull off was in his statement, speaking at an economic forum in early June 2021, calling to question the future of Russian gas transit through Ukraine, stating that it will depend on Ukrainian goodwill. What is that? Also in early June 2021, Ukrainian President Zelensky told US senators visiting Kyiv that as soon as Nord Stream 2 is operational with gas flowing, Russia will find a way to squeeze Ukraine out of its lucrative gas transmission business, which would cost Ukraine an estimated 3 billion USD a year, would in essence render Ukraine's army defenseless because it could no longer fund itself. According to Yuri Vitrenko, CEO of Ukraine's energy giant Naftogaz, Putin's primary purpose for creating a war with Ukraine is to give an excuse to blow up the existing gas pipeline that delivers Europe's 35% gas shortfall from Russia across Ukraine. But he wants it to look accidental, of course, which is what this whole elaborate NATO BS pretext is all about. So do you remember Putin saying that if the West doesn't give in on his demands, his outrageous, unreasonable demands, 
He'll mount a geo-targeted military response in Ukraine. Do you remember that? That's what I'm talking about. His geo-targeted military response in Ukraine is simply to blow the gas pipeline. He's in with his air force, bomb the pipelines and out. No casualties, no fuss, no muss. Petrenko, CEO of Ukraine's Naft O Gas, went on to say he is certain Russian gas will no longer use Ukraine's existing pipeline transmission system through Ukraine once Nord Stream 2 is online, despite the current contract it has with Russia until 2025. Ukraine's interior minister, Arsene Avakov, also recently predicted that Russia may not even honor the present contract and warned that Moscow could even sabotage the existing Ukrainian pipeline network in order to necessitate the immediate opening of Nord Stream 2, failing which Europe will plunge into a full-blown energy crisis this winter, with Germany bearing the brunt of the worst of it. Furthermore, Vitrenko argues that Nord Stream 2 is primarily a geopolitical weapon designed to hurt Ukraine and monopolize Europe's energy markets. Vitrenko goes on to say, the truth is that Russia only understands force. The US and the rest of the democratic world should show strength and unity. That is the only way to change Russia's malign behavior, says Vitrenko. Hmm, haven't we heard the very same warning by Putin's arch nemesis Navalny? In fact, Navalny, the man who knows Putin best, urged Biden to stand up to Putin in his Time Magazine exclusive interview. As Navalny explains, with mafia and authoritarian dictators like Putin, it's all about their power, their money, and that's their only Achilles heel. So any effective deterrent, it really must hit them where it hurts most, their money and their power. It's really that simple. Hmm, let's think back to what the Biden administration have done. Have they effectively done that? Yeah, right, quite the opposite. Remember Biden's pathetic display of weakness where he practically green-lighted Russians' invasion of Ukraine as long as it was quote-unquote only a minor incursion. Russia will be held accountable if it invades, and it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion. So now can you clearly see how Biden is falling right into Putin's hybrid warfare trap? I mean, it's playbook, guys. Just as Navalny warned, Biden's behavior is embarrassingly like a frightened schoolboy who's been bullied by a classmate. And as a result, Putin clearly sees Biden as the pussy he really is. And that's apparent from Putin's increased hardline position towards his unreasonable demands and his further military advancements on Ukraine's borders, with troops now reaching a whopping estimated 127,000. Have you heard this one? On January 20th, the Republicans came to the rescue. Fingers crossed. They stepped up and grew a brass pair big time by introducing the new Putin Accountability Act to Congress. It will deliver an unprecedented, crippling, preemptive blow, hitting Putin and his oligarch cronies personally, just as Navalny said we need to do, attacking what's believed to be their trillions in personal wealth. Many insiders believe it's our best bet at ending this nightmare conflict peacefully and in the West's favor. So let's take a look at what exactly is the Putin Accountability Act and how it will hit Putin below the belt. First, it labels Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism and sets out not to only sanction Russia, but moreover, impose personal sanctions against Putin, his family, including his two daughters, his lover, former Olympic gymnast Alina Kabaeva, government officials, every member of his cabinet, the heads of Russian law enforcement agencies, and Putin's closest oligarch cronies. Which, well, that's his real presidential mandate is to protect their ill-gotten trillions. And don't kid yourself, his life depends on it. Uh, if he were to lose power, the chances of him retiring peacefully are very, very slim. The chances of his cronies retaining their ill-gotten wealth is close to zero. In a press release on January 26, it seems Biden might have hinted about 
the Putin Accountability Act coming down the pike. Would you ever see yourself personally sanctioning him if he did invade Ukraine? Yes. You would? I would see that. So why is the Putin Accountability Act the strongest sanctions ever directed at any country's leader ever in history? Well, let's take a look at them. So get this. One, it immediately calls for the shutdown of Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That's it. It will not open. Two, it demands Putin to immediately pull out of the illegally occupied Crimea, can you imagine? Or face a worldwide import-export ban and including a ban on computer chips, which it desperately needs. Three, it kicks Russia out of the international SWIFT banking system, meaning they can no longer transact dollars in business. That would be a crippling blow. And if you think Russia's new SWIFT replacement system will safeguard him, not even close. It doesn't even replace 3% of the loss that the SWIFT system will incur. Four, it imposes sanctions on Russian's financial sector. And five, it bans Russian sovereign debt in the secondary market. Again, a crippling financial blow to Mother Russia. Now, the real power of the Putin Accountability Act is that it's meant to deter conflict before, is the imperative word, before it happens. It stands up to Putin now, now as a preemptive offensive strike hitting him where it hurts most, going after the few people he actually cares about in this world. It's straight from Putin's own Mafia Boys playbook, seizing Putin's estimated $225 billion in hidden assets abroad, and his oligarch tronies' estimated trillions in illicit fortunes accumulated in assets abroad. This will be the very first time in history that the U.S. government actually goes after the people that launder Putin's alleged stolen billions and profit from his gangsterism. While the powers that be have estimated Putin's illicitly contrived net worth at $225 billion, Navalny is adamant that Putin is by far the richest man in the world. And if you add in his oligarch partners in corruption, the total is believed to be in the trillions. That's the power Putin already wields. Next, in our upcoming part three of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict explained, we're going to cover one, if, as Biden says, war is imminent. And if so, when? When is Russia likely to invade Ukraine? And guys, as I promise you in part one, I'm going to share if and when my family flees Ukraine so you know how serious I am about the intel I'm digging up boots on the ground here in Ukraine. Two, the five biggest reasons and telltale signs Russia is unlikely to invade Ukraine. And three, if Ukrainian people are actually afraid of a Russian invasion and why. Four, if you have real estate, bank accounts or other assets in Ukraine, are they in jeopardy and how can you protect them? Now make sure you subscribe and smash that bell so you don't miss out on our continued inside coverage of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict explained no BS. Imagine meeting as many beautiful traditional ladies as it takes until you meet the one. That exactly what you can win right now. Just comment, subscribe and share. The winner will be announced live right here.